dyslexic or whatever, you know. So I think there was there was room for the goddess cult, and in the Bible, it's always parallel and alongside to the prophetic god cult. And it's interesting that Magdala was a place renowned for its visionary um, women. In the apocryphal writings in the Old Testament, Magdala was where prophetesses came from. Um, so the fact that Mary Magdala, I think it's a shorthand for Mary the prophetess, Mary the seer, in that ancient tradition, which goes back to the goddess of wisdom herself. So I think we need to rethink what we mean by orthodoxy and heresy. Mary Magdalene studies requires us to rethink that. So what we think of as heresy actually is orthodoxy from an authentic goddess tradition. And as a philosopher who's a lover of Sophia by definition, uh, I think our moral duty is to, is to reawaken that higher Sophia, that, that wisdom tradition. So Plato is my witness. I'm working on a commentary on the Timaeus because he, he says, before I begin any serious work, I will give praise to the goddess. And in his academy, which is the beginning of the word academic, was a temple to the nine muses. So before you begin your day's study in the library, in the, in the academy, you go to the temple and tune in. We have a little temple next door where you can go and tune into the muses here. You know, I'm trying to revive that sacred scholarship, which to me is, um, obviously it's in harmony with, with the ancient pagan wisdom of the past. But, um, and I think Mary Magdalene is, would be sympathetic to this work. I think she's part of it. Um, then there's another interesting field. 15 is, you know, when I came to France six months ago, I wasn't sure what to expect. Um, the image of France is a place of um, secularization and republicanism, and they got rid of religion. And whereas we, the Brits, have kept the queen and the church, you know, we're a holy nation. They're all blaspheming heretics. Um, and, you know, we've got our mystical stuff. But actually, it's, I just want to say to my British friends, that's absolutely not true. The French are deeply, deeply esoteric people involved in European uh, esoteric traditions. Um, and they have a particular interest in Mary Magdalene. There's, there's a tradition in French occultism that is um, interested in, in you know, Christian esoteric thought that's quite deep here. Um, and so the history of that can be studied. Um, you know, it's, it's very interesting. And um, <clears throat> connected to that is this whole new sort of academic field, Western European esoteric thought. And um, Wouta Hanegraaff in Holland has edited this amazing dictionary of Gnosis and Western esotericism, which everybody should have a copy of or get from your library. There's no entry on Mary Magdalene. Uh, which, uh, by the way, there's not an entry on Druids either. So, I mean, there are, we need a new edition of this book, Wouter, but it is a masterpiece, right? And um, I think that <clears throat> in, the, in the scientific study of Western European esotericism, Mary Magdalene has, has a, an honoured role to play. The occult groups like the Gnostic churches and so on are talked about here, and the Gnostic movements in general. So... You know, there's, but it's a small um, field. But they, they need to look, I think, a bit more at Mary Magdalene herself. Um, and then I mentioned the Druids, um, which are absent from this, this study, which is ironic because they were the esoteric savants of, of Northwestern Europe for you know, a very long time. It was an oral culture. They didn't write. We know about their traditions through the medieval legends and um, <clears throat> other sources. And obviously I've spent a lot of time in Scotland, Wales, Ireland, Britain, studying Druidry. Um, and there are people that argue that the Magdalene tradition came to Britain. There's a whole subfield of Magdalene scholarship that have Jesus and Mary Magdalene, or certainly Magdalene, coming to Glastonbury with Joseph of Arimathea. And there's a whole tradition in Britain of that. There's a friend of mine, Graham Phillips, has written a book claiming to have found the, um, the Holy Grail. The Holy Grail stories apparently were seeded into the Arthurian Celtic traditions. And his claim, and I think it's quite a good one, is that the Holy Grail legend is actually the, the, um, the ointment, um, the, you know, the jar that Mary Magdalene has shown in art. That's another of the icons. The alabaster jar. The alabaster jar that she carries. Um, that's actually the Holy Grail. It wasn't the cup that held the blood. It was, it was the ointment of the, the 
uh, anointment. <clears throat> and um, <clears throat> we've got a book here of, of him sleuthing it and finding it by all kinds of clues. Um, and apparently he took it to the British Museum and it was tested and it was authentic. It was from first century Palestine. It had uh, sort of healing ointment in, scrapings. So I suspend judgment, but it's an intriguing theory. Um, I think that the, uh, the Celtic church, um, and there have been many kind of revivals and as many Celtic churches as you can name, but, you know, Lawrence Gardner was very much in sympathy with this notion that the Magdalene tradition seeded the Celtic church and that Columba and these other great Celtic saints were bearers of that wisdom. Um, certainly the Druid culture was, um, you know, there were powerful women Druidesses and Druids and um, I think in, in, if Magdalene got to the Celtic world then she would have been very much revered. <clears throat> Even the traditions that have her coming to Renault Chateau and Renault Bain that was actually originally a Celtic region, <clears throat> and if you study John Markale's book on the Magdalene about Ren the Chateau, he, he, he reveals the Celtic roots of that region. And all around here in central France was a Celtic druidical land. Um, so I think there are many mysteries still to understand about that. Um, and they won't all be found in written texts. I think scholarship has to embrace what I call the transpersonal gnosis which is my notion of transpersonal history, but do it in a scientific way. So that um, I believe as Padmasambhava and Yeshe Tsogyal left termas in the landscape, so I think the Druids have left termas in the landscape of Gaul and Britain, <clears throat> which we can access if we learn how to do it properly. Um, and seership was part of the Druid training, you know, that's what Jesus and, and Mary Magdalene were practicing as well. And also non-violence. I think uh, the piecework is central to that continuing mission. Okay, next question is, wh which PhD students are working on Mary Magdalene? You'd have thought some would. Well, <clears throat> these are doctorates given recently in France, Britain, and uh, elsewhere on Mary Magdalene. There are a few people working on it, okay? So we had this um, Raphael Tacconi <clears throat> in France here, who looked at Burgundy in the 9th to the 15th century <clears throat> and where we're going tomorrow Vézelay is in Burgundy old Burgundy and it was the Burgundy kingdom that made Vézelay the great pilgrimage centre of Mary Magdalene because they wanted to be able to say we have the most important saint here come and visit and uh, this woman did a PhD thesis on that uh, which is great in French then there's somebody who did a work on Marguerite Poret who tragically was, was, was uh, killed Yuri Stoyanov is interesting. He worked at the um, University of London, where my doctorate is from, on apocryphal themes and apocalyptic elements in Bogomil dualistic theology and their implications for the study of Catharism. He, um, you know, is, is uh, now at SOAS doing work on Zoroastrianism. But um, it's very interesting the, um, to trace back the Cathar teachings, which is a huge, interesting overlap with Mary Magdalene studies, um, right back to their dualistic roots in Bogomil tradition, and then earlier back to Zoroastrianism. Um, but I think that this emphasis on dualism is perhaps missing the central theme of what Magdalene and Christ were trying to do. I don't think it was about splitting, but it, you know, <clears throat> it was about confronting and overcoming the diabolic forces in history, but that's done through understanding, not from, from confrontation. So actually I was having an interesting uh, conversation the other day about exorcism. The way the church exercises is quite violent. Go out, demons, you know, and they're a bit frightened. Where do they go? You know, is there a way to do it a bit more gently? Can we have a reconciliatory theology, of, uh, theology in which the demons can be somehow shown gradually to get back to the light, you know, or do we have to have this apocalyptic war between the light and the dark, which is going to, the world will be destroyed in, you know. Have you come across the <clears throat> Buddhist um, text, Feeding Your Demons, by um, Sultramanian? No, but I'd love the reference afterwards, you must okay. give me the reference, yeah. Amazing, um, amazing work. So this is, this is my own doctoral thesis, which is towards the transpersonal history of the search for peace from 1945 to 2001. 
which was about the Cold War. And we're living in a world in which, with the nuclear arms piled up, we can literally destroy the world. You know, if we don't overcome our demons, befriend them, humanize them, educate them, actually, ultimately, um, you know, the world can be destroyed. Now, the background for this, theologically, according to Zoroastrianism, is that this world was created as a battleground between the forces of absolute good and absolute evil. The Sayashant, who is the Messiah, is going to lead the forces of good. Now, I think the evidence, and Steiner and many other seers would back this up, is that Christ and his inner disciples were working with that Sayashant energy. They thought they were taking on the absolute final evil and were going to defeat it. <clears throat> How it quite worked out probably wasn't necessarily according to plan. I think they made it up as they went along. They weren't quite sure it was going to end in the crucifixion. And they, they, you know, they didn't quite know it was going to end in a resurrection. You know. The question is, um, different religions are different strategies in this cosmic struggle between good and evil, which I think, as a Platonist, is simply a struggle between ignorance and wisdom. I think the devil and God are just anthropomorphized projections of enlightenment or nescience, and that the struggle is for enlightenment, you know. Um, and each religion is a new attempt to do that. So Muhammad, what was he? He was a teacher. He started as a teacher in, Medina, in Mecca. Jesus was a teacher, a rabbi, you know. Um, so anyway, the project goes on. Here's another one that, that was done. Um, Laura Kin, Sacred Eroticism um, and the whole question of... Um, Christian approach to prostitution, of which Mary Magdalene was a kind of cult figure. Um, another one, a, a thesis on her as a counter-heroine, which was interesting, done at Cardiff University, not recent, uh, very recently, 2014. Um, here's one looking at angels and orthodoxy in Syria and Palestine, um, and proto-Quranic traditions, which eventually end up in the Quran, um, through the Gnostic traditions of Arabian Christianity, um, and whether Mary Magdalene's um, name, why doesn't it get into the Quran? That's a whole other study. Somebody should do a thesis on that. Um, so there's, there's been a few. Here's another one looking at art history. Uh, Catherine Bullock, um, icons of sexuality and so on. Other people have looked at particular frescoes. Here's one in, in uh, the Trentino. Other theses have been done on the Cathars, um, and you know, there's one here even on sarcophagi in Provence, which um, one of our speakers will touch on hopefully. So yes, um, there are doctoral theses going on. So I think these are the kind of people that we should work with if we're going to get Mary Magdalene's studies taken seriously. Um, in fact, one of the, oh, oh, Andrew Wellburn, who's, who's a kind of anthroposophical scholar, did a doctoral thesis um, at Cambridge, I think, on the Gnostic imagination of William Blake, which is interesting. Um, and this woman, Kaylin Asbo, did a thesis on the myths of Mary Magdalene in music, art, and culture. She's organizing a big Mary Magdalene conference as we speak today in California. Uh, they've got three days of, a bit like we're doing, but... Um, you know, more music, and although hopefully we'll have celebration later. So there are people, it's exciting. Um, I've talked about the Nag Hammadi tradition. Well, in the Gospel of Philip and Thomas, um, Mary Magdalene is identified with Sophia, wisdom, which is, um, in the biblical tradition, wisdom helps co-create the universe, or the world. And so... Is, is the sacred, uh, like Sarasvati is to Brahma in Hinduism. Brahma can't create without Sarasvati. They need to work together. And so what's so wrong about having Sophia in, in the form of Jesus' you know, um, co-worker, Mary Magdalene? He needed Sophia to do anything. Um, and that's what the Gospel of Philip and Thomas actually specifically say. So I think the logic is that these, this is what they were doing. 20 is interesting. As I said, the Islamic teachings are Mary Magdalene. Um, I've just been, well, I've studied Islam for many years. I taught at the Muslim College in London. I have many Muslim friends and students. Um, and they love Mary the Virgin. They, mm. they have a whole iconography of Mary, the mother of Jesus. They love Jesus as the Messiah. 
But there's an absence of Mary Magdalene thought in the Quran. Um, you might expect to find it in Sufism, in people like Ibn Arabi, and some Sufi scholars who've studied Christianity a little do understand the importance of Mary Magdalene. Um, interestingly enough, I've discovered that it's in the Baha'i tradition that Mary Magdalene is taken very seriously. The Baha'is were an offshoot of Sufi Shia mysticism in Persia, and they are very much stressing the equality of men and women, and um, they love Mary Magdalene as a precursor of the Baha'i tradition. Um, <clears throat> and I think it's one of the limitations of, I mean, all religions are limited. They're just boxes, vessels for spirit. And we have to be honest and acknowledge the limitations of, say, Christianity or, or Buddhism or Hinduism. They all have their limitations because they're human attempts to channel what is, what is beyond us. And Islam is limited. And one of the ways it's limited is because Muhammad wasn't a scholar. He wasn't a learned man. He never read Plato. He, he didn't understand cultural context. He'd never read the Gospels. You know, he was, he was a, a desert-dwelling, inspired genius. Um, and if you deconstruct what was going on in the Quran, which I've done in commentary, very detailed, yes, it's amazing for some things, but it's lacking in others. And I think one of the tragic explanations behind the whole Crusades and the clash between Christianity and Islam was to do with this absence of reverence for woman in her own right as a powerful thing, the teacher, and the silencing of woman, the veiling of woman, um, by so-called orthodox Islam, which I actually think is heret heretical Islam in the Wahhabi tradition. Um, you know, and the Taliban is the extreme sword arm of that, or the Al-Qaeda types, who are going around France stabbing people on the beach because, you know, um, it doesn't fit in with their cultural norms. So this is a fault line for peace scholarship to be done at a high level. And the pilgrimage traditions um, are banned in Wahhabi teachings in Islam, except the pilgrimage to Mecca. You know, but all the other traces of prophets and saints are erased. So when Al-Qaeda take over a region, the first thing they do is blow up, blow up all the shrines of the saints. And as a Sufi myself, initiated into the Sufi tradition, you know, this is a heresy. Because we should revere and accept all the sacred teachings of all the ancestors, in my view, including Mary Magdalene. So there's a lot of work to be done here, and my commentary on the Quran is, is an attempt to do that. I do recommend you spread it around. Then we have the Black Madonna tradition, which deserves studying in its own right. Um, you've just, Nicola's just been to Leon Basilica, haven't you? And there was a Black Madonna there, is that right? Um, you know, <clears throat> black Madonnas are, are obviously the Virgin Mary, but there are some black Mary Magdalens as well. And I think that um, Lynn Picknett has Mary Magdalene as, as an Ethiopian. She says this is because she herself was black. Um, you know, it's possible. Um, I think it's probably unlikely in that if she was an Ethiopian, it would have been commented more by the official Gospels. Um, you know, it would have been unusual, I think. Um, Madonna is Sarah. Who's yeah, the, the, the Egyptian, yeah. So, um, but I think it's, it's interesting that um, also in the Solomon text, the, the, going back to Sheba, you know, the black bride of, of Solomon, I think it's, um, the colour black is sacred in, in um, Egypt and in um, Tantra and so on. It's, you know, represents embodiment. So um, <clears throat> I think it, it's an alchemical uh, thing this. Yeah, the, the Negredo and all that. Then we come to um, the history, another field is the history of all the pilgrimage sites in France, um, of which there are many, which I didn't really appreciate. I mean, I'd always heard of them, but Vézelay, <clears throat> where we're going tomorrow, and Saint-Marie-de-la-Mer, and um, saint maximin la saint Baume. well, hopefully we'll hear a bit about all these t um, later. Uh, but people have studied them. There's a book um, which I've got studying their authenticity and when they started becoming pilgrimage sites. You know, there's people are working on that. Then there's another question that intrigues me because we've got Magdalen colleges or Magdalen colleges at Oxford and Cambridge, which is interesting. You know, why did medieval scholars want to name colleges after her? <laughs> um, 
I think they were on to the realisation that she was a teacher, an important wisdom figure. Um, I want to find out where are the, all the other colleges in the world that, have, that are called after the Magdalene and, you know, get them in the study association. I want to find out where, where there's a library of Magdalene studies. I'm beginning a little one here. But surely there must be one somewhere. Um, you know, uh, what other educational institutions uh, are working on Magdalene studies? And if not, why not? That's the question of the Romany tradition, number 24. Saint Sarah, as you said, was very important, who came with Mary Magdalene by tradition to South of France. Did you actually go to that place, yeah. Saint Mary Okay. One of the most sacred yeah. places on to. Okay, so we'll hear all about that hopefully in due course. Um, uh, Romanies are very interesting. I, I'm rumoured to have a bit of Romany blood in me through my father, who was part Irish. Um, I've met Romanies and I, I once helped mediate between a dispute as an interfaith mediator. Um, the Romanies have been very marginalised in, in European society and, and generally in the Middle East, um, the travellers, and I'm not surprised they adopted Mary Magdalene as their kind of patron saint in effect, because she was marginalised, she was wandering. And this tradition of her coming to France as a refugee, like a boat person actually, it's given the thousands of people fleeing across the Mediterranean. They're all like Mary Magdalene figures, you know, we saw them washed up on the beaches of Greece and so on. Um, endangered people fleeing from war zones, <coughs> women and children coming and then being drowned, you know. It's such a sad, um, you know, why can't we stop these wars? Um, and, but anyway, the Romanies, who were persecuted by the Nazis and, and rounded up and gassed in concentration camps, they are wandering people and they're the standard bearers of that um, that wisdom. Christ himself said the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. It meant he never stayed in the same place twice. He was always moving about, which was our original nature. We're all wanderers, nomads on this planet. And so Mary is the kind of patron saint of the nomad tribes, which I think is appropriate. Um, so then there's question of, and this is a question of ongoing research. Um, some, some modern churches have developed, you know, particularly American that identify with Mary Magdalene. They've taken this notion as, well, let's have a church, let's remake it as a Mary Magdalene church. So what's their history? Where do they come from? Um, you know, people are working on that. Um, I'm interested in the question of the African churches. My interest in Ethiopian churches, the Coptic, um, you know, the, the, this Ethiopian church was very, very ancient and uh, apparently it was, goes back to Philip. Um, and do they have texts on Mary Magdalene and so on? Um, they've certainly got the books of Enoch. It'd be interesting to go to Ethiopia, talk to Ethiopian scholars, theologians, see what they've got about all this. The Rastafarians, who are an offshoot of that, um, they, they would have some interesting insights, I'm sure, about this, and the, particularly the kind of ecstasy element of Christianity, which we've lost. Um, and the Rastafarians use um, shamanic, you know, use of um, wisdom substances in their sacraments. Did the early church practice that? Um, you know, discuss. I mean, I've got a Rastafarian book upstairs which says that Moses' burning bush was, uh, you know, a psychedelic plant that had illuminated him. And they know the recipe. They've still got it in the Rastafarian circles. And that brings in the whole question of study of altered states of consciousness and things, which is fascinating. Were Jesus and Mary practicing this? You know, suspend judgment, let's find out. Also, in the Eastern forms of Christianity, the Aryan, Nestorian, Gregorian, Armenian, Syriac and Indian forms of Christianity, what's her status among these churches? Um, well, let's find out. It's very interesting. I've been to India many times and have a fondness for the Thomas traditions of Christianity, who was the apostle that went east. Um, and Thomas seems to have been very close to Mary Magdalene. They were in the inner church of the Gnosis, I think. So I'm sure there, you know, uh, there are traces of Mary Magdalene there. Did the Cathars have special teachings about Mary Magdalene? So that's a whole other field of studies. I think the answer is yes. And the, the understanding is that they believe that um, Mary Magdalene and Jesus were in some kind of consort status. They didn't believe in the official church's teachings. 
And this was apparently one of the reasons the Catholic Church hated them so much and wanted to attack them. And they burned them on this day in Bézier, 22nd of July, mass slaughter of Cathars, because they were all celebrating Mary Magdalene and Jesus' you know, sacred marriage. So this is right at the heart of the politics of <coughs> the Cathar movement. A lot of what we ought to know about the Cathars have been lost because their books and so on were destroyed. We have the records of the Inquisition, um, but some, they're due, they're, they can be interpreted different ways. French historian um, Emmanuel Leroy Ladurie wrote this famous book, Montaillou, based on the Cathar Inquisition records in this one village in the south of France. And the Cathars don't necessarily come out, out very well in that. He, he, they, they're not particularly female friendly, actually, on the street in the average village. So the, to what extent are we romanticising our back projection on the Cathars? Um, you know, discuss. You need, we need to go into that more detail. Um, um, but we do know they had ordination and they, you could be a, perf, a parfait as a woman. They had no discrimination at that level. You could reach enlightenment and um, you could receive the um, uh, consolamentum and, and the higher rites of the Cathar church which I'm sure is what Jesus was preaching and practicing with Mary. Um, to what extent were they influenced by the Manichaean teachings? This is a whole other field of study. Mani, you probably know, is a Gnostic teacher who came between the time of Jesus and the time of Muhammad. He's kind of midway there, 270s AD. And he integrated Zoroastrianism, Buddhism, Christianity, and paganism. And he was from northern Iraq from partly Syriac or Aramaic speaking roots and also his uh, Persian roots. And he was a synthesizer. And he does mention Mary Magdalene. We only have fragments of their writings, but he knew about her. And he has, in one of his psalm books that was used by the Manichaean church, um, she's referenced. So he also wrote a book called The Giants based on the Book of Enoch. So he knew about the Enochian texts. And Marnie was an amazing character. Augustine was initially a Manichaean, and then, you know, um, did a Manichaean rejection of Mani. I think scholars shouldn't zigzag. We should be, you know, going straight for truth. And um, there are elements of truth in Mani, but then there are complex, um, you know, uh, culturally bound untruths which um, need need to be ferreted out. But anyway, there's a huge field of Manichaean studies which overlaps with Mary Magdalene studies a bit. <coughs> Why was she chosen as patron saint of the Dominican order? Was this a cynical ploy by the Dominicans who wanted to silence and conquer the Cathars? And they realized she was their most important saint, so they co-opted her. Well, it's beginning to look as if it might be, because I've written to the Dominican order, and I've contacted them and asked, do any of you lot publish a journal of Mary Magdalene studies? Have you got chairs of Mary Magdalene studies, you know, and there's a complete silence and a blank. The Dominicans are failing in their duty. If they are devotees of Mary Magdalene, they're not doing their job. And Thomas Aquinas, for all his wonderful verbosity and intelligence, um, <clears throat> you know, doesn't seem to have managed to <clears throat> somehow work out the importance of Mary Magdalene. And the fact that a lot of these Dominicans became inquisitors using torture, I think is abominable and disgraceful. You know, we should never use torture for people's souls and conscience. And their theology based on Augustine was false, which was that if you're a heretic, your soul is in danger of being in hellfire for all eternity, because they, I think they had a false literal view of hell, rather than a psychological state of disturbance. And therefore, to save your soul being burned for all eternity, I'll do you a little bit of torture now, maybe half an hour, a couple of burning irons, so you repent and turn back to the Orthodox Church, that's me, and then I'll save your soul from hell for all eternity. So I'm doing you a favour if I twist the irons and get you screaming and repenting. I'm actually, I know it hurts me as much as it hurts you, but it's worth it, right? Well, I think that is a false teaching, and that was, but that was the justification that Dominicans used for torturing Cathars, and then the whole floodgates were opened, heresies, heresy hunting, Judaizers, and witches, you know, and it was floodgates were open till the Enlightenment. Isn't that sadism, um, though? 
Sorry? Isn't that sadism that you're describing? Well, I think my... Uh, I think it can't because that term wasn't invented. The Marquis de Sade wasn't around. Pleasure in Well, then we're talking psychology, but there's something very odd going on. Uh, that's another explanation, is they were just taking pleasure in it. I don't yeah. think so. I think they genuinely thought they were doing the, their victims a favour. But I think they're, they're wrong, and I think we need to explain exactly why and how. So, and Matthew Fox was a Dominican. Matthew Fox is the guy that can get Magdalene studies launched in the Dominican community. And I have written to him and told him about what we're doing today. And I hope he'll come and talk next year about this. Um, right, so I think I'm going to uh, pause there. And, um, well, hang on, let me go on a tiny bit. Um, so we've got um, the Cathars um, and the question of reincarnation. One of the important things that Cathars had is, again, a belief in reincarnation, which is mainstream. That's what most religions have. Pl Platonism, East, e Eastern mysticism, Buddhism, you know. The Cathars were mainstream. They weren't the heretics here. They were the orthodox believing in reincarnation. But now, with transpersonal psychology and the evidence of past life regression and so on, I think we can be more scientific about reincarnation. People like Arthur Gjordam and others... Um, and transpersonal philosophers have looked at reincarnational theory. I think as scientists, scholars, we should look at this and say, well, you know, what's going on here? And, and if it's true, <clears throat> rather than persecuting people that believe in reincarnation, we should be working with them, studying and learning from past life research. Um, and so that's very exciting. That leads on to anthroposophy, because Steiner, of course, was a pioneer in so many ways who believed in reincarnation, his karma lectures are brilliant in that regard. What does he have to say about Mary Magdalene? Well, he has quite a lot, actually. In his commentary on the Gospel of Mark, and in certain lectures, um, he, he appreciates her significance. Um, I used to be the librarian at Steiner House in London many moons ago, and so I researched you know, in depth his interest in Gnosis, which is significant. And the whole idea of anthroposophy, divine wisdom coming to be in human form, anthropos man, Sophia, is, is a brilliant idea. But it's not restricted to Steiner. It's something we should all be working with. <coughs> okay. Can I ask about the Steiner thing? Yeah. I heard that Steiner had said that Jesus was actually a twin, and that there were two Jesuses, mm. and what, one of them was crucified, and then the other was able to go on and do the teaching. Yes, there is a theory in Steiner to that effect, yeah. Um, which is actually an old Gnostic idea that he picked up on. And um, I think possibly even going back to Marnie, who believed we all have like a twin. There's, there's me and then there's my twin, which is looking down on what I'm doing. We all have a twin soul. Um, the thing about Steiner is, of course, he gave, he never sort of wrote his ideas down on comprehensive logical work. He gave lectures which were inspired, and some contradict other things he said. Um, and then there are some lectures he gave to esoteric groups that are not available to everybody. So the whole field of Steiner studies is itself complex. And it's I've dipped my toe in it enough to know that it's a whole lifetime. <laughs> so somebody could do a PhD on Steiner's views on Mary Magdalene and spend 20 years doing it. I'm not joking. Um, the same with theosophy. Theosophy is interesting, of which Steiner is almost a break, breakaway. But theosophy um, and the Mary Magdalene tradition and the Cathars in theosophy is interesting. We, we've discovered the connection with Lady Kate Ness, who was a friend of Blavatsky in Paris, mm. um, helping set up the Gnostic Church through some channeling from a, Cath a Cathar priest. So the theosophists have been interested in the Cathars for a very long time. And... Um, I'm sure that if you study the Secret Doctrine and Blavatsky's work, you'll find many references. Um, be interesting, that's another thesis in its own right, Blavatsky's teachings on Mary Magdalene. Uh, that would be worth looking into. Um, and the same with Freemasonry. Um, Freemasonic history is of interest, and they have a particular interest in Mary Magdalene. Um, you know... Um, their learned lodge, the Quattro Coronati, which published papers on the history of Freemasonry.